Uh, part of the reason why I travelled all this way with no pay and only a small supper as a reward uh, is the Tony Benn thing. I, I often dealt with Ben while he was a politician. He was always extremely nice and easy to, to deal with, very unpompous, very open, very friendly. Um, but, you know, he's, I think his second career is better than the first one. I'm not denigrating his role as a politician, but, you know, he does these public meetings. And he's fantastically good. He sits there, sometimes with a guy who plays guitar, and he tells very, very funny stories, which tend to be slightly subversive. And I've seen him three or four times, and he always tells one particular story which I like about Gandhi. Do you know this one where on Gandhi, on his first visit to London, was asked by some rather pompous journalist what he thought of Western civilization, And Gandhi said that he thought it would be a very good idea. <laughs> and... Uh, if you asked people generally in this country what they think of quality journalism in Britain, you might get rather a similar reply from a great many people, because we're in trouble. Journalism in this country is in terrible trouble. And because I'm a hack, I like to put the, the, the news in the first paragraph. I'll tell you what it is I'm going to try and say, and then we'll spell it out. What I want to argue is that if you look back three or four decades, the 60s and 70s, all newspapers, particularly those on the right, but all of them, were united in their hostility to the trade union movement. And the argument from these newspapers was that unions were unelected, overpowerful bullies who blackmailed government into doing what they wanted rather than what the electorate wanted or needed. And those newspapers assisted the Thatcher government in using the law and public order policing to break the power of the trade union movement. And what I want to try to uh, argue is that the, gap, the, the, the position that was once occupied by trade unions is now occupied by those same news media who were so critical of them. That the news media now have become this same kind of force, unelected, overpowerful bullies who blackmail government into doing what they want to do. And I want actually to pitch a question to you so that if we do this question thing afterwards, I, I actually genuinely want help with answering it because it's a very difficult question. How do we regulate a free press? Okay. So if, in talking about this, I want to look at three different headings. Quite, quite briefly, you'll be glad to know. The first is about truth and falsehood. The second is about privacy and its invasion. And the third is about the political influence of the media. So if we take truth and falsehood first, if any of you heard me talking before, I, I can ramble on for hours and hours about this. It's, it's basically what that book, Flat Earth News, is about, but I'm going to try and concentrate it into about ten minutes <coughs> to explain it to you. It's like reduced Shakespeare. Have you seen the reduced Shakespeare where they do the entire work of Shakespeare in 90 minutes? I'll give you Flat Earth News in five or ten. Better than Shakespeare. <laughs> so the thing is, if you start with the, the, the reason why I wrote Flat Earth News, the trigger is those same weapons of mass destruction that Andrew Gilligan talked about when he gave this lecture. Th there is this globally important story that flows through news organisations all over the planet, and all of those news organisations, to a greater or lesser extent, got it wrong. The weapons weren't there. And when it became clear that they'd got it wrong, those same media organisations, with very, very few exceptions then covered that story, i.e. the story of the misinformation, as though this were a tale of governments and intelligence agencies screwing up, without recognising that if you look at the shape of the misinformation, in fact it's triangular, and the third player in there is the media organisations themselves. And because they wouldn't acknowledge their role, they didn't ask the obvious question, which is why. And that question is very important, because if you stand back and look at the way we perform, if you ask, first of all, what's our primary purpose? If we've got a justification, what is it? It is, as I think Tony Benn may have been saying in his uh, lecture, to tell the bloody truth. That's the beginning and the end of the justification for the media. We have to tell the truth. If we're not doing that, we can't justify our existence. So if you look at the way we operate, we actually fail to tell the truth alarmingly often. We do it with those great global stories like the WMD or the Millennium Bug or most of the scandal around Bill Clinton. We're doing it on a marvellous scale about sex trafficking, which I've just been looking at. It's just terrifying the way we do it. We do it with thematic stories in the areas that I've looked at, which are like education, uh, criminal justice, illegal drugs, things like that. You dig down into media coverage, which is the same effectively as digging down into government policy. And you say, where are the facts on which this edifice is constructed. And you don't find facts. You just find populist misconception and falsehood. I could go into the detail, but I won't, because this is the reduced Shakespeare version of events. And so, masses and masses of this falsehood stuff. So why, 
If you talk to people outside the media, they tend to say that this is to do with proprietors leaning down from on high and telling us what to write. And the truth is, that does happen. There's no question about it. I've done some stuff in the book about Rupert Murdoch's utterly unscrupulous uh, exploitation, abuse of his journalists in order to achieve particular political or commercial objectives. It happens. Uh, People also say that it must be to do with advertisers, that we need their money, therefore they can dictate an editorial line. That, in my experience, in national media, is really very, very rare. And the point about the owner interference is kind of similar. That does happen, but it happens on a scale which is far smaller than outsiders imagine. So I can't justify this, but I kind of believe that if you could quantify it, you could account for only maybe 5 or 10% of our failure to tell the truth by looking at owners and advertisers. There's something else going on. And what I'm trying to argue in a single line is that the logic of commercialism has moved into our newsrooms and usurped the logic of journalism. And this has happened because over the last three or four decades, more and more news organisations have been bought up by whacking great corporations whose primary interest is profit. And that changes the way in which these organisations work in all kinds of ways. The, the, w- one of these ways is structural and is quite important. So when I was researching this book, Mike Jemson from MediaWise, who's sitting here, who's a good man, helped me to raise a lot of money from the Roundtree Charitable Trust. And we used that to hire some long-suffering academics from the University of Cardiff to do some extremely tedious but nonetheless important research for the book. And one of the things that they did was to go through the annual reports of all the Fleet Street companies looking at the way in which big corporations who were taking over had tried to cut their costs by reducing the number of journalists who were involved in producing their respective newspapers. And at the same time, even more tediously for these poor academics, we sent them off to the uh, Museum of Newspapers, the newspaper library in Collingwood in North London, to measure the physical space which those journalists were filling because those corporations, intent on increasing their income, were printing more and more pages so that they could carry more and more advertisements, because that's a big source of income. And what we discovered as a crude bottom-line figure, when we crunched all the figures together, was that your average Fleet Street journalist now is filling three times as much space as he or she was in 1985, which was the baseline we started with. And that's terribly important, because if you flip that round and look at it from an operational point of view, it means that on average we have only a third of the time to spend on each of our stories. And there are some processes uh, where if you reduce the time involved, it's benign. Like if you're manufacturing cars, and somebody on the planet still may be, if you're doing that, if you can do it quicker, the car becomes cheaper, so the price drops, so you can sell more, so you have more money to invest, it helps you. But with journalism, it's, it's malign, not benign. You take away time from journalists, you take away our most important working asset. We can't do our job properly anymore. And this is the beginning of explaining why we now are so prone to to push out false stories. Because we got these saying academics to look at some of the implications of journalists working without enough time to do their job. And we took a random sample of more than than 2,000 home news stories, i.e. news stories about the United Kingdom, from the four quality newspapers in this country, the Times, Telegraph, Guardian, Independent, and also from the Daily Mail. I know you wouldn't want to call it a quality newspaper, but it's very important. So we had more than 2,000 stories. And these academics addressed each of these stories with a question. Insofar as this story is based on a central factual statement, is there evidence that that statement has been checked? Now, you know the answer that you're going to get, because our object in life is to tell the truth. So our primary function is checking. This statement is false. We don't want it. This statement is true. We put it in the story. So the answer you're going to get is 100%. But the answer they got was 12%. It's the best newspapers in the country. 12% of the stories showed evidence of being thoroughly checked. That's what happens when you start to take, when you take away time from journalists. And with those same sample of more than 2,000 stories, they did another exercise, which was quite complex, and they did a brilliant job on it, which was to find the origin of the raw material from which those stories were constructed. And the answer should be that it's coming from the journalists who are going out into the community and making contacts and finding stories and checking facts and all that old-fashioned stuff. But what they actually discovered was, funny enough, the, the proportion of the material that was being generated by the journalists themselves was the same figure. It was 12%. 8%, they couldn't quite get to the bottom of the barrel and discover where it had come from. 80% of these stories were constructed from second-hand material that was coming from two sources, 
from wire agencies, that's like Reuters or uh, the Press Association, and from the PR industry. Now, in the reduced Shakespeare version of the book, I won't go into it, I'll just state it as a fact and expect you to believe that both of those sources are, in fact, inherently unreliable as a source of truth about the Britain or the world. And if what journalists do is to sit chained to their keyboards, recycling unchecked material from those two sources, what it means is that we are structurally likely to produce stories which are false or distorted or contain propaganda. I'll give you one facile example which which sets the pattern. Um, While I was researching the book, it's terribly hard work writing a book. I think we should pass a hat round afterwards to compensate. It's really, really, it hurts. I put on a stone and a half because to bribe myself to stay at the desk, I had to keep eating these enormous peanut butter and jam sandwiches. And so one particular day I was getting bored. This was in the summer of 2006. I went to the Guardian website to see if there was anything more interesting to read. And this was just in the build-up to the Football World Cup that was due to be played in Germany. And there was a nice little story on the Guardian website uh, which had been supplied to them by the Press Association, the main wire agency, news agency for the United Kingdom. And this concerned uh, an England football fan who was so worried that England would perform badly in the World Cup that he had taken out an insurance policy, which meant that if he suffered emotional trauma as a result of England's poor performance, he'd get a payout of a million quid. Now, it's a funny thing being a journalist, because you're always on the lookout for things that don't quite fit, because that's often the clue to a story. Uh, And in this particular case, the thing that I picked up on was this man's name, the football fan. He was called Paul Hucker. And I thought, that's a funny name. It's quite unusual. And also... There's something funny about this, because if I was put in the position of being Mr. and Mrs. Hucker, about to give birth to this baby, and I'm trying to decide, we're trying to decide what name to give it, I would be very sure I wouldn't give it a name beginning with an F or a P, because you can see what it would spell if you did that. So you know that you're not going to call your Hucker baby Paul. But in fact, that was a false clue. This man had cruel parents. He actually was called Paul Hucker. (laughs) But anyway, having been led into this story by this false clue, I started to ask other rather obvious questions. Is there really a football fan who's this neurotic or stupid to believe that this payout is going to occur? Is there really an insurance company that does these sorts of policies? So I went to the chained journalist's best friend, Mr. Google, and I Googled Paul Hucker's name. And he popped up several more times in newspaper stories, always about insurance. So here was Paul Hucker saying oh, I've just got myself a new job. I'm very pleased with my salary, but I'm worried about what would happen if I was made redundant. But now I'm not worried. I've got an insurance policy. And it was the same when he bought a house. There he was doing this story about how he got the coverage from an insurance company on his mortgage. So uh, what was striking, of course, was that in all three stories, it was the same insurance company. So I rang the insurance company and I said, uh, could I speak to Paul Hucker? And they said, putting you through. So I said, I need to write him a letter. What department is he in? They said, oh, he's our director of public relations. PR. So this is a completely phony story. Paul Hucker is not a football fan. He is the PR man for the insurance company. He's contrived a completely fictitious story. He's fed it to the news agency, he's PA, and they feed it out. Now, knowing that this story was false, I then watched it. And over the next 24 hours, it spread through news outlets all over the United Kingdom, radio, telly, Print and website. Good story. Let's run it. Obviously false. Never mind. And then in the second 24-hour period, it went global. You could find it in in Canada and Australia and South Africa. Everybody likes football. This is a great story. You could see it in Indonesian and Turkish. Paul Hucker, a million pounds. Just garbage. And, And this is the model. If you want to understand why we ran all those stories about the weapons of mass destruction and the Bill Clinton scandal and the sex trafficking and all the rest of it, it's that same model. Recycling, unchecked, second-hand material from wire agencies and PR, usually overlapping. It's exactly the same. So you don't need... If you want to corrupt reporting on some particular subject, you don't need to be an advertiser, to go in and say, oh, I'll take my money away if you don't do this. You don't need to go into a restaurant with the owner and smoke enormous cigars and cut some deal. You just package it up prettily as PR, feed it to the news agencies, and we will print it for you. It's easy. The door's hanging open. We've lost our immune system. We're not checking. I'm arguing we're structurally likely to produce falsehood. There's much more to this argument, but let me just put that there as a a strong suggestion. Now, what I really want to look at is about regulation. Remember the question I put to you. What happens if we run a story which is not merely false, but damaging? It might be damaging in the sense that it it damages government policy and produces bad law. Or it might be damaging in the sense that it... It really offends some individual 
and damages their reputation so that people think worse for them. And yet it's false. What is supposed to happen in those circumstances? And basically, a, a victim of media falsehood has three possible courses of action. The first is to write a letter to the newspaper and say, everything you've said about me is false, you've damaged me, please publish. And you are completely at the mercy of the editor, uh, who may or may not decide to do so. And I would have thought uh, Mike and others in this room will say, most editors, most of the time, will not give you. Funny enough, I think the only news organisation in this country that's really, really 100% good at always publishing letters which attack it is Private Eye who have a completely open policy on it. Otherwise, you just are going to be filtered and you see whether or not you can have influence on the editor. Right, your second course of action, if that doesn't work, is to sue the newspaper for libel. Libel is a a mess. It doesn't work for either side. Libel, first of all, is a rich man's law. You can't get legal aid to sue for libel. So for decades... Uh, there's this routine, you know, if I write a story for The Guardian or any other newspaper, it goes to the lawyer. And if it's contentious, the lawyer going through it saying, hmm, can we get away with this, can we publish it, will frequently say to me, the reporter, has this chap got any money? Is he rich? And if he's rich, we have to be careful. If he's poor, it's cool. He's not going to be able to to, to sue us because it's just too expensive. You may know that recently they introduced a slightly new system which is called the conditional fee agreement. But what it means is that I can go to a lawyer and say, in theory at least, I want to sue the newspaper, and the lawyer is now allowed to say, OK, well, I'll take that on for free. You don't have to pay me anything. And if and when we win, then uh, I'll take my fee out of the, the damages that are awarded or the legal costs that are awarded to the other side. Now, that sounded like a good idea because it did mean that anybody, in principle, could sue and not just rich people. But it's fouled up pretty badly because the lawyers have taken advantage of it. When they win these cases, they are charging the most enormous fees. And so it's causing huge damage on the other side of the fence. It just is, it's had a chilling effect on good journalism. It isn't reasonable anymore to publish certain contentious statements which you may know are true because the, the legal costs on, with these conditional fee agreements are much, much bigger than they used to be. So it's terrifying. And plus, most lawyers won't take you on if you try and sue unless they're sure that they're going to win. So it still means that most of the time, the non-rich client can't use libel law to get justice. Okay. So you can write to the editor, you can sue for libel, they're both deeply unsatisfactory, and the libel law also is unsatisfactory, not just from the point of view of the victim, but from the point of view of the newspaper. Well, then the third option is that you go to the Press Complaints Commission. And uh, the PCC is a a, a weird body. It's set up by the newspaper industry itself, which funds it and populates its various committees to a greater or less extent. And its job is to provide a free fair, quick service for people who have some complaint against the media. I, it's, it would, I could spend all evening telling you about how ghastly this organisation is. It's an embarrassment. But let me just give you a few examples. A few years ago, I wrote a story about a school. Uh, and the deputy head teacher of this school came out of the story looking pretty bad. It, there was a lot of trouble at this school. And two parents from that school separately complained to the Press Complaints Commission that my story was inaccurate and unfair. So the PCC sent me a letter saying, we've had these complaints. I thought, ah, God, what a nuisance. I'm going to have to spend time researching my defence. I mean, I'm okay. I've got plenty of evidence, but it's just a nuisance to have to gather it together. And I sort of put that to one side, deal with it when it happens. Well, then, a few weeks later, I got a second letter from the PCC saying, um, we've rejected the complaint. I thought, this is rather wonderful. I haven't even prepared my defence. And we've rejected it because the complaint comes from two parents and not from the deputy head teacher himself. So I said, well, that's rather weird, because if my story is, in fact, inaccurate and unfair, surely we should be correcting it. What difference does it make who it is who's drawing that to our attention? But I kind of went quiet, because the PCC have saved me all that effort. The complaint's rejected. Well, then, a little bit later, I did a lot of work on the story of two sisters from South London, who you might remember, called Lisa and Michelle Taylor, who were jailed for life for murdering a young woman called Alison Shaughnessy. And the idea was that the older of the two Taylor sisters, Michelle, hated Alison Shaughnessy because she was going to get married to her, Michelle's ex-boyfriend. Do you remember this case? And I was one of several journalists who thought that the conviction of the Taylor sisters for murder was deeply suspect. And we ran a lot of stories pulling the evidence apart. The case went to the Court of Appeal, and for various reasons which I needn't go into, the Court of Appeal released the Taylor sisters, said you, you, you should never have been convicted, you should never have been sent to prison. Good. 
Actually, but, but I need to explain that one of the reasons that the Court of Appeal let them out was that during their trial, the press had fastened onto the sexual aspect of this jealousy and had published fantastically overheated and false stories about the evidence, because that helped them to sell papers. And the Court of Appeal said this is, this is outrageous to misreport a court case while it was going on. It was clearly likely to have an impact on the jury. And so the, the High Court reported five national newspapers to the Attorney General and said, I want these people prosecuted for contempt. Well, the Attorney General's never going to get into a big fight with Fleet Street because that's you know, bad news politically. So they got away with it. But they hated the Taylor sisters, these newspapers. And a year or two later, the Daily Mail did a big double-page spread about the Daily Sisters, the, the Taylor sisters, in which they said they're guilty of murder. They should never have walked away. And this story was, I mean, just repulsive in its dishonesty, full of fabricated evidence and distortion and general ghastliness. And because I'd worked on the case, I knew the Taylor sisters and their parents. I was really shocked by it. So I talked to the family. And the sisters said, right, we're going to sue. So they went off. And I put them in touch with a good firm of lawyers. And they ran into this immediate problem of the cost. And the lawyer said, well, maybe, maybe we can do one of these conditional fee agreements. We can do it for free. Let us think about it. And in the meantime, I said to the parents, look, you go off and complain to the Press Complaints Commission. So the parents went off and did that. And the whole thing went nowhere. After a month or two, the lawyers said to the sisters, we know you're telling the truth. We know you're not guilty of murder. But this case is so long, so complicated. It could easily cost us a million quid to get it into the uh, court. And it's just too big a risk that if we don't win, we can't lose that sort of money. So we're terribly sorry, but we can't take the case for you. So the two sisters said, all right, well, if we can't sue, we'll go, like our parents, to the Press Complaints Commission. And as soon as they went there, the Press Complaints Commission said, oh, yes, we're rejecting your complaint immediately because uh, it's been more than a month since the story was in the paper. They said, hang on, they accused us of murder. It's not true. Now, it's more than a month, you're out. Right? It's like the third-party rule with, with the, the, the deputy head teacher. There's a technical rule. But never mind, the parents are still in there slogging away. Fifteen months later, the Press Complaints Commission produced what they called a decision in the case of the parents, because the parents had been mentioned in the story. They'd been accused of fabricating evidence to try to get the girls wrongly out of their life sentence. Are you with me? And the Press Complaints Commission said, ah, oh, yes, well, we've decided, our decision is that we're not going to make a decision in this case um, because, um, first of all, uh, it doesn't really fit our code of conduct because the parents are only complaining about part of the story, not all of the story. The parents said, well, hey, you're accusing us of fabricating evidence. That's a criminal offence. No, 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 it doesn't fit because it's not all of the story. And then they said, anyway, if you're really serious about this, you should sue. But we can't afford to sue. We've just discovered the lawyers won't do it. No, no, well, anyway, for these technical reasons, you're out. This is what the Press Complaints Commission did. So in this book, I, I, I should tell you, I got a researcher to do this, to go back through 10 years of the annual reports of the Press Complaints Commission, analysing what they did with complaints from people. And we found they'd had, over that 10-year period, more than 28,000 complaints from people saying, this story isn't accurate, or this newspaper has invaded my privacy, or harassed me, or done some damn thing that's against the code. And more than 90% of these complaints had been rejected for that kind of technical reason. Right? Oh, it's taken more than a month. Oh, it's a third party. Oh, it doesn't fit the code. No, 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 no. Go away, go away, go away. 90% of them, of the, it was just under 10% remained that got through the technical hurdle. And with most of them, once the newspaper heard that somebody was complaining and the PCC might consider it, they just bunged in a correction or clarification. And what they do, these newspapers, is you can have a front-page story saying Nick Davis is a paedophile and a murderer, and then they put the correction on page 86 down the bottom. And they always lie about this. They say, no, we give it a quick. They don't. <clears throat> and then there's this tiny proportion that go through to a proper hearing and adjudication. And most of those then get rejected, right? So when we crunched all the numbers together, what we found is this body, which is supposed to adjudicate on complaints, had actually upheld 0.69% of the 28,000 complaints that had been made to it. And the problem with the PCC, which is becoming more and more serious, as I hope I can explain, is that they utterly failed to show the kind of robust independence which is needed if they're going to deal with the victims of the media and its malpractice. They're just because they're funded by the media who they're supposed to be policing. Okay. Just this one little other example, which I think is quite striking, was the whole business of Maddie McCann, <coughs> where the media had... I think not, not just an extraordinary level of falsehood in accusing the parents of conspiring to kidnap, stroke, murder their own child, but an extraordinary level of cruelty that when you've had your child kidnapped, you then have to endure that kind of coverage. 
And there's a, a select committee been taking evidence about media standards. And the, a guy called Sir Christopher Mayer, the former chairman of the PCC, who's just gone, thank God, he went and gave evidence to this committee. And he was asked, <clears throat> why didn't you get in touch with the McCanns when they were down there in Portugal and say, look, make a complaint, and then we can step in and tell the media to back off and start telling the truth. And Mayer mm, fumbled and bumbled and finally said, well, I didn't have a phone number for them. This is so pathetic. The, 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 the McCann's house in Portugal was ringed with journalists, working many of them for British organisations, with whom Mayer is in daily contact. All he had to do was to ask one of these journalists to put a letter through the letterbox. Please contact me. Please give me your phone number. And, and then they could have taken the complaint and then done what they should have done, which was to issue a really clear warning to the media. You back off these people, stop making up lies about them, stick to the truth, or we're going to produce a report that names names and really hammers you. They didn't even begin to do it because the PCC, for want of a better word, is structurally corrupt. Okay. Now, <clears throat> that's, that's the first thing I wanted to talk to you about, falsehood and our difficulty in getting falsehoods corrected, even when you have a media that is structurally likely to produce false stories. Okay. Second thing is privacy. The three quick stories I want to, to refer to. The first is, and this is about regulation as well as privacy, Max Mosley. You remember this story. He, ran the, he, he, he still runs, I think, the organisation which organises Formula One motor car racing. And the news of the world hide a camera in a room where he's having sex with three or four prostitutes. They do a big front page story. They edit down their video and put straight on their website pictures of Max Mosley, stark naked, having sex. It, it, to me, this is a massive, massive invasion of privacy. I think you would see it in the same way, too. Now, Mosley's a man with money behind him, and so he succeeded in suing the News of the World for breach of privacy. And uh, in spite of the fact that News of the World uh, reporters and executives gave evidence which the judge indicated that he thought were lies, <clears throat> Mosley won. And he was, made, he was given a, pay a payment for breach of privacy of about 60,000 quid, which is the biggest payout there's ever been for a breach of privacy in this country. And the news of the world squealed. But if you stand back from that and say, OK, he's a rich man, he managed to get the law on his side, what did our friends in the Press Complaints Commission do? And the answer is that in the beginning, Mosley spoke to them and said, can you help me? And they said, uh, no, uh, because uh, you're suing, therefore we don't have to. Another technical loophole, nothing to do with us. And then when he won... Christopher Mayer, who I was talking about, the former chairman, giving evidence to the select committee, was asked, well, why didn't you do anything about this? And if you read the transcript, which is online, you'll find that Mayer goes into this long snigger all about how ridiculous Max Mosley's naked buttocks looked in the video on the News of the World website. Absolutely no sense of the outrage of what the News of the World had done to this man at all, just sniggering like a grubby schoolboy about Mosley's bum. <clears throat> and what he clearly should have done was he, even if he hadn't done anything on Mosley's behalf in the first stage, once that judgment comes through, the biggest payout ever for a breach of privacy, the Press Complaints Commission, if it was a real referee, if it was really doing its body, would call in the Fleet Street editors and say, now listen, there's a thing in British law called privacy, and you have to recognise it. You do not have the right to uh, trespass into people's private lives. And this is becoming more and more important because... You know, in the argument about why we produce so much falsehood, I'm saying it's basically about commercialism. As newspapers' business model goes into a state of collapse, largely because of the, the uh, pressure from the internet taking readers and advertisers, the commercial pressure in newsrooms gets more and more extreme. And therefore, the temptation, not only to invent false stories, but to invade people's privacy, to find something salacious enough to sell the paper, gets greater and greater, do you see? And I would say that we have now reached the point where for the first time in human history, we have an industry, particularly in this country, which harvests the private lives of people in order to make profit from them. This is a new and, I think, really genuinely alarming development. And do not reassure yourselves that it's only the lives of celebrities that they're interested in. They are particularly interested in the lives of public figures, particularly if they have sex with anybody. But anybody is a potential victim of the media. If you do something sufficiently quirky enough, particularly if it involves sex, they'll come and get you. And, and there's the line saying, private, they'll crash over it in search of their story. And if that worries you, I'm saying there's nobody there on the side of regulation who will stop them. So there's Mosley. The second case I wanted to mention on breach of privacy involves a guy called Steve Whittemore. 
Whittemore's not a victim, he's a perpetrator. He's a private investigator. He lives down in New Milton in Hampshire. And in March 2003, his home was raided by people from the uh, Information Commissioner. Now, the Information Commissioner is a funny little body. Its, its job is, among other things, to police the Data Protection Act. And that, that's the law that um, keeps uh, all sorts of uh, computerized databases confidential. Okay? So th th what they knew was that this guy Whittemore, this private investigator, ha had organized some kind of network which was able to get into these confidential databases so he could get your uh, itemized telephone bill and your lists of friend and friends and family who you call most often, your uh, bank statement, your credit card statement, your tax records, your social security records, your medical records, which are pretty blooming private, your tax records, the whole lot. All those confidential databases were being penetrated by this guy Whittemore. But there were two things they didn't realize about him until they got inside his office and seized all his paperwork. One was that he was a meticulous keeper of records and had kept a record of every single time he had done this illegal thing on behalf of any clients. And the second thing they hadn't realized was that his clients were newspapers. And what they found inside his office was that over the last three or four years, he had undertaken more than 13,000 uh, entries into these confidential databases on behalf of newspapers. He'd worked for more than 300 different journalists who'd made these requests. The total amount they'd paid him was more than half a million pounds, right? got inside there. And they came away with all this paperwork which showed all this evidence. And uh, they put Steve Whittemore on trial at Blackfriars Crown Court in London. So he was busted in March 2003. It took a long time to prepare the case. It was March 2005 when Whittemore came up. And this particular trial was about the fact that he and three others had got inside the police national computer. Now, that's a particular criminal offence separate from the Data Protection Act that I was talking about. Very serious criminal offence. But a rather weird thing happened. So he's in the dock with three people. Two of the others are private investigators who've been helping them. And one is a civilian police worker called Paul Marshall. And Paul Marshall worked at Wandsworth Police Station, civilian worker, and he took phone calls from members of the public. And what he was doing, because he was being bribed by Whittemore's network, was that he would write down phony, non-existent phone calls from members of the public to justify his getting into the police national computer to extract information about people's criminal records or ongoing police operations to give to Steve Whittemore so that he could sell them to newspapers. Okay? Now, Paul Marshall was also uh, quite vigorously interested in his sexual life. And for various reasons, he had stolen from Wandsworth Police Station police uniforms, handcuffs, and a truncheon in order to do... I can't imagine what, with his partner. Okay, so before Steve Whittemore and these three, including Paul Marshall, came up for trial on extracting the information from the computer, Paul Marshall was put up on trial on his own for stealing police equipment, okay? And he said, I'm guilty. And the judge said, well, this is very serious stuff. You know, you're stealing, that's theft. You're stealing from an employer, that's a particularly serious theft, and the theft, the employer is the police. So I think you're going to have to go to prison. And uh, up pops Paul Marshall's lawyer and says, well, look, don't do that. This guy's dying. He, he, we're talking really seriously dying. He's probably got two or three months to go. And that's the end of it. So the judge said, oh, all right. Well, if he's dying, all right, I won't do that too. But don't do it again. Conditional discharge, which is like the lowest level of things. Okay. A few weeks later, up comes the trial on the police national computer. Whittemore, Paul Marshall, and the other two guys. They all say, we're guilty. And the judge says, okay, well, I'm going to um, send you to prison because you can go to prison for the police national computer. Well, up pop the lawyer and say, hang on a moment. Paul Marshall here was guilty of theft just a few weeks ago, and the judge gave him a conditional discharge. This offence on the police national computer is not as serious as, as theft, so you can't give Paul a more serious uh, punishment than he got for the, the theft. So the, so the judge said, OK, he'll have to have another conditional discharge. Well, and then if he's got a conditional discharge, what are you going to do with the other thing? They're going to have to have conditional discharges. So they all walked out, went down the pub and got fantastically drunk. And thank you for the policeman's truncheon that had come in so useful. So that all collapsed and went nowhere. And then there was a second trial which had been organised by the Information Commission. You remember, they're the guys who actually ran the raid. And this is about getting into all those other confidential databases that I was talking about. He had this amazing network of people, like he had this Hells Angel down in Worthing uh, called Taff, who was uh, brilliant at conning British Telecom. He knew the internal jargon of how British Telecom worked, so he could ring them up and pretend to be an engineer or somebody in the accounts department and get uh, the itemised phone bill or whatever faxed to him. It was Taft. There was all these other people. There were two people in the DVLA. So if they, you gave them a registration number, they would sell you 
the home address and all the other personal details of the person who owned the car, the whole network. So that whole network was going to come up for a second trial, okay, for breaking the Data Protection Act. Well, then the Information Commission said, oh, no, if they only got conditional discharges on that very serious offence on the police national computer, that's all they're going to get on ours. So they scrapped that trial before it even started. So the whole thing went nowhere. Now, that's pretty bad. But what I want you to look at is this. What's missing? What's missing here? They took armloads of information from Whittemore's office, which details not only the network who are penetrating the databases, but the journalists who are paying them, more than 300 of them, from almost every single national newspaper in the country. How many national newspapers were charged by the police in relation to accessing the police national computer? None. How many national newspapers were charged by the Information Commission in relation to getting into all those other databases? None. Why? Because newspapers are powerful and rich. I'm not being paranoid here. This is on the basis of talking to the people who were involved in bringing these cases. What they said to themselves was, if we prosecute those newspapers, first of all, they will hire very expensive Queen's Council, not your ordinary lowly barrister, QCs, and we'll have to match them, which is going to cost us a lot of money. Secondly, they will organise masses of complex preliminary hearings where they argue legal points. And we'll have to be there for all of them, and the legal bill is going to be enormous. Let's just not do it. So they back off. So the law is there about the police national computer and all the other... But it, isn't, it was not enforced against the news organisations who were simply considered to be too big a beast to go after. The third example of breach of privacy involves Clive Goodman. <coughs> so you probably know this story. What happened was that in August 2006, the police uh, raided... The News of the World's royal correspondent. Let us be clear that he's not a member of the royal family. He just covers the royal family. That's why we say he's royal correspondent. Uh, they raided this man, Clive Goodman, and the private investigator, Glenn Mulcair, who had been working for the News of the World. And this was a, a huge shock to everybody. Nobody knew that the police were investigating this. And what emerged was a trial in January 2007 where the, the, the News of the World reporter, Clive Goodman, and the private investigator, Glenn Mulcair, were charged together that they had intercepted the voicemail messages that had been left on three uh, staff who worked in Buckingham Palace for Prince Harry and Prince William. And separately, Glenn Mulcair on his own was charged with intercepting voicemail messages from five other people. Uh, well, we, we, there's no need to name them at the moment, but, there were, but five others. And they went to trial, and the reporter got four months in prison, and the private investigator got six months in prison, and that was the end of that. Uh, there was no more information, and the News of the World put out a lot of public statements and said in various different uh, fora that this was a, a, an outrageous piece of deception by this reporter, Clive Goodman, who had been using the private investigator to do this dodgy stuff without them, the News of the World, knowing. It was an act of deceit by Clive Goodman. And that the private investigator was then charged with these five other uh, people who he'd been uh, intercepting voicemail messages from. The News of the World said, well, God knows why he was doing that. He did it off his own bat. It certainly had nothing to do with us. And they briefed reporters, this is PR at work, about Goodman. They said that <clears throat> he was a sad character. He'd once been younger and more energetic and had been very well connected with contacts on the royal family. But he'd rather lost his way and grown old. And younger reporters were coming in. They had much better contacts. And they even released this nasty little joke about Goodman. They said he had no contacts. And in the office, he was known as the eternal flame because he never went out. <clears throat> so that was the story, and it was all wrapped up neatly. And there it would have stayed. Uh, a, a deceitful reporter and uh, an overactive private investigator. But everybody else has and that's it, a small story. But one of the five people whose voicemails were also intercepted in the charges that were laid against the private investigator was the chief executive of the Professional Footballers Association, a guy called Gordon Taylor. And what Gordon Taylor knew was that... Well, so first of all, he knows from this court case that this private investigator has been intercepting his voicemail messages. But what he knew was that the news of the world had certainly been working on a very unpleasant story about him at the same time as this private investigator was intercepting his messages. So Gordon Taylor said to himself, well, that's an awfully interesting coincidence, and the news of the world is saying this private investigator was just doing this for some reason. It was nothing to do with us. I just don't believe it. They were all over me. News of the world reporters were all over me. They must have been involved. So he sued, and his lawyers put in a, a, a statement of claim to the court, and the news of the world put in a defence saying, this is absolute rubbish. We have nothing to do with all of this. We don't know what you're talking about. You're wrong and you're foolish. Okay. So then, once you're suing somebody, you can get a judge to make a court order to disclose information from other sources. 
So the judge in this particular case said, OK, well, what I'm going to order is that, first of all, the information commissioner has to disclose anything that he got from Steve Whittemore's office, you remember a couple of years earlier, that relates to, to the news of the world. In fact, I think to all, the four newspapers that News International own in this country, Times, Sunday Times, News of the World, Sun. You have to hand that over to Gordon Taylor's lawyers. And secondly, Scotland Yard, who seized lots of material from Glenn Mulcair, right, the second private, they have to hand over any of that material that relates to this man, Gordon Taylor. So Gordon Taylor's lawyers then get these two chunks of paperwork, and they're full of sizzling stuff. The information commissioner, it names. You see, the information commissioner had never released the names of any of the journalists who had been using Steve Whittemore. This is too complicated for you. Are you with me still? I hope you're still with me. They, now, oh, no, all, we'd all be thinking, who oh, the hell are these journalists? Oh, no, 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 the information commissioner won't release them. You don't want to get into a fight with newspapers. There suddenly were the names of 31 journalists. I think there were 31 on the News of the World and the Sun alone, never mind the Times and Sunday. 27 of them were from uh, the News of the World and four from the Sun. And I don't mind telling you, even though I didn't put it in the paper, that, that what really, really freaked them out when this was sent through to News International was that among the News of the World journalists who had been uh, using Steve Whittemore to get illegal access to confidential databases was Rebecca Wade. Now, Rebecca Wade was then the editor of the News of the World. She went on to become the editor of the Sun, and she is now chief executive of News International, responsible for all those four papers, and Murdoch's favoured daughter. She, you cannot touch Rebecca. Right? And there she was, named. Ah! And all these other guys as well, names, 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 names. There were some of them, I mean, there was one guy called Lewis Panther, who works for the News of the World. He'd done 130 separate requests to Steve Whittemore, just absolutely casually. Law, we don't deal with it. We just go through it. All right, so that's pretty worrying. And then, even worse, the paperwork that comes through from Scotland Yard shows that contrary to everything that the News of the World had told everybody about this case, Clive Goodman was not the only journalist who was involved in this. When Glenn Mulcair, the private investigator, went intercepting voicemail messages from Gordon Taylor's phone, other News of the World journalists were involved. One of the bits of evidence that they produced, that Scotland Yard handed over to Gordon Taylor's lawyer, was an email, which I happen to have here now. And this is, a, this is an email from a News of the World journalist called Ross Hindley. And it says at the top, it's so sad when you get old, you can't read without glasses. Here it says in capital letters, this is the transcript for Neville. I've copied the text, da -da 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 -da. Transcript for Neville, Wednesday, June 2005. Neville is Neville Thurlbeck, the chief reporter of the News of the World. Ross Hindley is a, a junior reporter. So here we have two journalists from the News of the World communicating by email. What does the email contain, you may say? It contains the transcripts of more than 30 voicemail messages that have been intercepted from the telephone of Gordon Taylor and his lawyer, Joe Armstrong. There they all are, in black and white, masses and masses of messages, clearly moving from one journalist to another, and they've been supplied, it's clear from the email, from all the detail, by Glenn Mulcair. That's proof, okay? So what do the news of the world do? Well, of course what they do is they come forward into the public domain and say, we now recognise that everything we previously told you was false, we're putting our hands up, in fact our journalists were involved. Are you kidding? They did not. They said to Gordon Taylor, look, psh, how much would it take for you to go quietly? And so Gordon says, I don't know, what are you offering? So you remember uh, Max Mosley, Naked Body, having sex on the website, got the biggest payout for breach of privacy in the history of this country, 60,000 quid. Do you know how much they paid Gordon Taylor to go quiet? 450,000! Right? He wasn't naked, he wasn't having sex, but he had something that was deeply embarrassing to the news of the world. Hey, hey, have some money, have some more money. For God's sake, sign this agreement, say so you'll never say a word. Right? So once again, they managed to keep it all quiet. Nobody knew this had happened. Until, uh, this is nothing clever on my part, somebody gave me the story. He said, here, look, look what the news of the world are doing. And in fact, it wasn't just Gordon Taylor. Uh, there were two other people who, it's clear from the evidence that the Yard produced, there were two other people who were linked to Gordon Taylor, whose phone message, uh, messages also had been intercepted. Okay, so this goes in the Guardian. You may know about this in July. So there's this big hullabaloo, a lot of public figures running, because yeah, there's, there's lots and lots of this been going on at the news of the world. But so once more, just look at the regulation. <clears throat> there are two people involved here who could say to the press, stop it, you're breaking the law. The first are the cops. And once the, the story comes out, we discover more and more about what the police have been doing, and we found various things. First of all, <clears throat> if you go back to the time when the reporter, Clive Goodman, and the... God, I'm going to talk forever. And the private investigator were arrested... Um, the police go into particularly Glenn Malcair's house and come out with a vast quantity of material. Computer records, paperwork, 
tape recordings, right? And everybody who's seen this material says there are thousands of names of public figures in there who, who Malcare was targeting, getting information about these people on behalf of the news of the world. Now, it's a very, very British story, this, because what the police did was they had originally been asked to investigate by Buckingham Palace because several of their staff realised that something dodgy was happening with their vo voicemail messages. So the police do a really, really good and thorough job on the royal family and their, their staff, right? Completely get to the bottom of the barrel. And then they look at this vast quantity of material and they say to themselves, should we now investigate everything else? Now, <clears throat> the answer was no. They didn't attempt to investigate all of the other material. And I'm only maybe 80% certain of what I'm about to say. I've spoken to somebody at Scotland Yard who's very senior, who says that he believes but cannot be sure that there was a meeting of what they call the senior management team at Scotland Yard where they asked themselves, what should we do about this case? And the senior source says that for two reasons they decided not to pursue the inquiry, not to investigate all of this other material and its leads. One was that it was an enormously expensive thing to do. It was going to take a lot of resources. And the second was... Why on earth would we, Scotland Yard, want to pick a fight with the biggest media organisation in this country? Let it go. Do you see? It's that same pattern again. You don't go after these big beasts. So they didn't investigate it. They allowed it to go to court. They allowed us to believe that the entire extent of this scandal was three royal staff and these five other characters. That's not true. And it, again, it's very British, because it turned out that right back there at that early stage, they had discovered that the three royal staff weren't the, weren't the only members of the royal household who'd had their mobile phones directly attacked by Glenn Malcair. Prince William and Prince Harry also had had their phones done. But in this funny sort of deferential culture in Britain, you don't want to mention a prince's name in court. So they, weren't, they didn't mention them in charges. It's such an odd thing. My, I believe there were one or two other members of the royal family. I don't mean the Queen, but other people who were also. And we weren't told about them. It's a very British thing. And then for the rest of it, we just conceal it. We'll say nothing, and which isn't good enough. When our story came out, Scotland Yard said, oh, well, there was only a handful of victims. And what they do is, Scotland Yard, they will make high-profile statements which say this scandal is very small, and then very, very quietly behind the scenes they'll admit what they, ha what they really can't carry on denying. So they said, oh, just a handful of victims, it's a small thing. Um, uh, but they, let me just explain, they went to the select committee. You know, there's been this select committee taking evidence about the media. The police, very senior police go along there and say, it's only a handful of victims, it's a small thing. And that's what gets reported. But then they submitted a written memo, right, which didn't get reported because it doesn't get read out. And I found it on the media committee's website. And in there, in paragraphs 15 and 16, literally way down, they say... Oh, well, we did find victims in the royal household uh, and the military and the government uh, and the police whose voicemail messages had been hacked by this guy. And, and we did ask MI5 to conduct a security review of the implications of that. Right? That's buried in paragraph 15 of this written memo. And then it says, and there were some other names which we passed on to the mobile phone companies so that they could investigate. And what you're dealing with here is those those people where there was pretty clear evidence in this mass of paperwork and stuff that they'd seized that something bad had happened. There's a mass of other names, including John Prescott, the Deputy Prime Minister, where it just isn't clear what this private investigator was doing, so they haven't even begun to investigate. So when they make this public statement, there's only a handful, they're not telling us the truth. And then they said, oh, and the other thing is that we warned all of the victims. We've been to them and said, look, we've discovered your phones were being intercepted, your messages were being intercepted. That's also not true. So the police are not there regulating the press. Actually, the thing that is really rather funny, you know this thing here? There's, there's this man, Ross Hindley, sending these transcripts. It's, it's clear, incidentally, that he's been sending other transcripts. And there's Neville Thurlbeck, the chief reporter, receiving them. So, obviously, what the police do, if they're trying to get to the bottom of this, is that they go and ask questions of Ross Hindley. Who gave you these tape recordings? Who asked you to type and send this message? And they go to Neville Thurlbeck, and they talk to him. No, they don't. They didn't ask a single question of any of these people. Nothing. This is not the police doing their job properly. This is the police backing off a fight with the media. And then the other person who's in there, the other body, so I'm not going to talk forever, I feel I've talked forever a long time, is the Press Complaints Commission. When the, the saga originally broke, the PCC, under our friend Sir Christopher Mayer, conducted an inquiry. And Mayer said publicly, I'm going to find out what, what is the practice in relation to phone hacking in every newspaper and every magazine in this country. And they did a brilliantly subtle thing. They then went and asked their questions to people who couldn't possibly give them the right answer, i.e. the truth. So in relation to the news of the world, they said, we can't talk to the 
man who was editor while this was going on, Andy Coulson, now David Cameron's right-hand man, because he's resigned. Actually, that's no reason at all. You can still say, come on, let's ask the question. And so they got Coulson out of the picture. Well, then they could still have spoken to the managing editor, the deputy editor, the chief reporter, the junior reporter, anybody at all at News of the World. They just chose not to. The only person they questioned was the new editor, a man called Colin Myler. They said, what was going on at the News of the World over the last five years? I said, I don't know, I wasn't there. It was brilliant. So they, they, so they managed to conclude that the only person that was involved was Clive Goodman. That was back along, before this material surfaced. Well, when the Guardian story was in, they said, oh, we better have another inquiry. And this inquiry was just so blatantly dishonest, it makes you sort of weep to read it. Uh, I, I, OK, so they only asked two questions. One was, uh, when the News of the World told us a couple of years ago that Clive Goodman was the only person involved, were they misleading us? Was that the truth? And, they came, and so they came to me and said, have you got any evidence that anybody else other than Goodman was involved? So I said, yeah, sure, try this. And there was another couple of documents I offered them. Uh, so they produce a report and they say, this is pure speculation as to, <laughs> as to the involvement of other journalists. There is no evidence to support the Guardian's contention that anybody other than Clive Goodman was involved. So that's out the way. The news of the world didn't mislead us. It's breathtaking. And secondly, they, they, they produced this report. They spent about half of it attacking The Guardian for saying that after all this original fuss when the trial happened, and after the first inquiry by the Press Complaints Commission, the business of this interception of phone mail messages had carried on unabated. And they quoted all sorts of evidence to show we were wrong to say that. The interesting thing about this is that their evidence may well be right. I have no idea. But you can read the stories that we published as many times as you like, and you will see we never, ever, ever said anything at all about whether or not this had continued after their first wretched report. Everything we wrote was about that private investigator, Glenn Mulcair, who went to prison in January 2007. Everything we wrote about was under the editorship of Andy Coulson, who resigned in January 2007. We never said anything at all about what was going on in 2008, 2009. But they absolutely put the boot into us because we can't produce any evidence to show that it continued. Do you see? It's just extraordinarily dishonest. And then what happens is they publish this report, ta-da, and the Guardian says, this is complete bollocks. So we did masses of stuff saying whitewash, 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 and I would defend that coverage. But if you read the Times, prop Rupert Murdoch, or the Sun, prop Rupert Murdoch, or the Independent, edited by Roger Alton, who was sacked by the Guardian group, you would think that the Press Complaints Commission had discovered that our story was all wrong. I mean, it's scary. When you put all this together, do you see you have this media, I think, driven by commercial pressure, generating falsehood, invading people's privacy, and nobody dares to regulate them. So the final little thing, because I am talking too much, is the political influence. The obvious political influence that the media have is by publishing stories which, which push government into policy areas. And some of that is scary, as I've described in the book, because you find it's a kind of chaos where the media themselves, driven by commercial pressure... If you take the sex trafficking as an example, 95%, I would say, of what the media have published about sex trafficking, smuggled women, forced to work as sex slaves, is urban myth. And yet government is legislating on the basis of that myth. There isn't even a clever conspiracy involved. It's just a mess. So, but what's also terribly important is the subtle way in which newspapers use a network of influence to change the way in which government operates. So, I mean, on a very small scale... When The Guardian are having this row with the news of the world about the voicemail interception, you find the political correspondence of news international newspapers going down into the House of Commons, into the lobby, briefing members of Parliament with all sorts of poisonous stuff to persuade them to take against us, do you see? So it isn't just what you publish. It, the, the, the journalists who work for Murdoch are this wonderful network of influence, headed by Rebecca Wade, who's got an extraordinary ability to make people like her. She's, she's very, very clever, very... She is likeable. It's extraordinary, she's very, but she's in there, everywhere. Um, and it's the same with the police. The, the crime correspondents and senior executives from News International talk to Scotland Yard and clearly influence the way in which they conduct their business. So, you, you follow this through... Uh, you know I was talking about Steve Whittemore, this guy who gets inside all these confidential databases. The Information Commissioner saw all those trials collapse. It was all very upsetting. And, but the Information Commissioner is not a bad guy. He said, look, one of the problems here is that the law, not, not on police national computer, but the law on all these other databases, like your bank account, is the penalty is really weak. Even if you're guilty, all you get is a fine. Why don't we see 
if we can persuade government to introduce a prison sentence, a two-year prison sentence, and then these newspapers would think twice before they hire private investigators to do this stuff again. And the Information Commissioner did all sorts of lobbying and consulting and went all through the system. And late in 2007, Gordon Brown agreed that he would put a clause in the Criminal Justice Bill that was going through Parliament early last year, 2008, to make it an offence imprisonable with up to two two years in prison if you got inside any of these databases. Okay? And then, early last year, Gordon Brown had a dinner with Paul Dacre, the loathsome editor of the Daily Mail, Murdoch McLennan, chief executive of Telegraph Newspapers, and Les Hinton, the chief executive of News International, who has now been replaced by Rebecca. And these three guys go into Gordon, and I don't know this, but it feels a little bit like the Cray twins going in to see somebody who runs a pub. So, and they're saying, so you're going to put this clause in the criminal justice bill? Yes, says Gordon. And they say, I wouldn't do that if I was you. <laughs> And Gordon, you know, like the old mafia thing, you want to stay healthy? So So Gordon withdraws it. Just think what's going on here. These are the people who've been routinely breaking the law. More than 13,000 requests, half a million quid, more than 300 journos. And they're allowed to go in to see the Prime Minister tell him how to rewrite the law. It's like if burglars were going in and saying, now, Gordon, we don't like that business about the prison for burglary. Could you knock that back? Oh, yes, says Gordon. No, Gordon doesn't do that for burglars. He only does it for newspaper groups who break the law. So they pulled the clause from the criminal justice bill. That's, That's the network of influence at work. (coughs) <coughs> and what will happen in the near future is, uh, next month, December, the Media Select Committee in the House of Commons will publish a report about the standards of uh, truth-telling in the media, libel, invasion of privacy, all these things that we've been talking about. And one of the things, I think, that I'm making a dangerous assumption here, but I think the politicians on the Media Select Committee, A, are quite bright, and B, are honest. And I think that they will probably put the boot in to the Press Complaints Commission for its multiple failures of the kind that we've been talking about. So what will happen then? Uh, There will be a move among lots of MPs in Parliament, many of whom are very pissed off with the press because of the um, expenses, horror, to introduce proper regulation by law, to disband the Press Complaints Commission, or at least to insist that it is seriously regulated. But we know that Murdoch has formed a new alliance with David Cameron. And we know that The Sun have been running some pretty grotesque news stories as part of that alliance. So what will happen is that the Tories will stall any kind of vote or action in relation to the Press Complaints Commission until the election, which is due in May at the very latest. And once they win that election, as it appears they will, they will then stop any attempt to reform the Press Complaints Commission in order to pacify Murdoch's newspapers and Paul Dacre and all the rest of them who went and said, if you want to stay healthy, right? Because this alliance is the way in which the, the, they can deliver the, the electorate to themselves by using the influence of these newspapers. And um, th- th- there is actually, um, but partly because of stories done by The Guardian, there's, there's going to be a vote on, you know, you know I said that the, Gordon Brown withdrew that clause about making it an imprisonable offence? Well, that's now popped up again. Jack Straw, under pressure from The Guardian, has agreed to give the House of Commons a vote on it. It will be very, very interesting to see the way in which uh, the newspapers lobby and use their alliance with the Tories to do the same thing, to stall it out. And in the middle of all this somewhere is David Cameron's right-hand man, Andy Coulson, who was editor of the News of the World while all the interception of those voice messages were going on, who was deputy editor while all that accessing confidential databases was going on. Is it true that Andy Coulson never knew anything about any of that? And the position at the moment is that I can't tell you the truth. I don't know. This remains to be seen. But imagine what will happen if we get hold of paperwork that shows that Coulson was involved. What will happen then? How much more cover-up will there be? So I'm about to stop. So what I want to say is if, if, you, if you talk to journalists about the possibility that we should have some new form of regulation, they immediately say, we have a free press. But it seems to me that that, that argument cannot be allowed to just sit there unchallenged. It's like saying... It's like a rapist saying he believes in free love. So, so yes to the free press, but not, not to falsehood, not to people, not to invading people's privacy and turning all of our private lives into a commodity to be sold for profit. It isn't okay. I, I really have had enough of it. And it denigrates all, anybody who's trying to do honest journalism is dragged down by this stuff. I think we have to think again and we have to be willing to regulate the press. But how do we do that without trespassing on the necessary freedom of the press? And in the same way, if it comes to privacy, like, so we, we need an organisation to which any media victim can go 
without hiring hugely expensive lawyers, without dealing with the slippery, structurally corrupt PCC, some genuinely independent body, and you can go to them and say, look, that story in the paper isn't true. And the body investigates, says to the newspaper, you have to publish a correction. That's what we want. It's as simple as that. It doesn't need huge damages. It's to do with correcting falsehood. And on privacy, what would really work well is if there was a similarly independent body that journalists could go to. Because, you know, the thing with privacy is, on the whole, the law, if we were to apply it, says, I can't come trespassing into your private life unless I have public interest on my side. So, for example, if, there's a, if I have good evidence that a, uh, a cabinet minister is involved in a corrupt relationship with an arms dealer, but the only way I can finally clinch it is to get inside his bank statement, the law would allow me to do that because I'm proving a case of serious crime and corruption. Okay? But the difficulty for the reporter is that nobody really knows what public interest means. Where is this line that says that is public interest and this isn't? Right? It's very difficult to define. So what would be very good is if we had a genuinely independent body that we could go to while we're writing a story and we could say to these people in confidence, look, we're thinking of getting inside this minister's bank account. Do you reckon that's covered by public interest? And they would say to us confidentially, yes. In which case we would feel uh, that we were on strong ground and then if anybody sued us, we would be able to say, we went to the independent body and they said it looked good to them. That would be a very powerful thing to be able to say in court. And if they said no, Max Mosley's bottom is not a matter of public interest, that would be a very serious problem if he sued. Do you see? The difficulty is this. Who do you trust to set up this independent body? The Press Complaints Commission have proved to us, in spades, beyond doubt, that you cannot trust the press to regulate itself. Right? So you can't have the press running this independent body. It won't be independent. But also, I don't think that you can have the government running it because it opens the door to censorship and abuse. There are far too many politicians who I wouldn't trust anywhere near an organisation that had the power to tell newspapers whether or not stories were false or true, let alone on the privacy point. We would never have got the MP's expenses story out if that was the case. So where do we go? Right? So, so I think I'm going to stop talking at the moment and ask you genuinely to, if anybody's got any brilliant ideas about how we could set up a body that could do that. It comes really to the question I asked at the beginning. How do you regulate a free press? Thank you for listening to me. You've been very patient. Uh, what's the form here? Do we, we're doing questions, yes? Is there, an, is there um, a mic? Someone's walking around with a mic. I can't see it. Hi. Is there someone walking around with a mic? Yeah. Okay, here's a hand Great. down here. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. <coughs> and could you please give your name and say if you're connected with the media? Um, I'm James if Garrett. Any. I'm a journalist. Um, why doesn't the government extend the role of Ofcom? To okay, cover I was press? thinking about. Yes. Uh, sorry, for, for, those, for those who don't know, Ofcom is a, uh, is a, is a regulator that covers all, uh, all commercial television. The BBC is partly covered by Ofcom. But it has, it has the power, and I think it's, uh, you know, it's quite draconian power, to, mm -hmm. in the case of a broadcaster, to actually take its licensed broadcast away. Uh, it can levy some pretty stiff fines as well. And... I suspect okay. that's the only sort of language that newspaper proprietors understand. Because wh while I was coming down on the train, I was trying to work out what to say. And I wondered about Ofcom. The fact is, I don't know very much about Ofcom. I don't know how it is funded and how it is appointed and whether we can trust it to be independent of the media and independent of the government. You would say yes. Are you, what, are you a broadcast journalist? Can you have the mic back? <clears throat> I mean, in some, to some extent, I share your concern, but I suppose... The proof of the pudding for me has been in the eating, and I, I spent 15 years uh, working in ITB, both regulated both by the ITC and mm -hmm. subsequently by Ofcom, which replaced it. We were able to, uh, to publish some fairly... Uh, it didn't get in the way of investigative journalism. You have, mm -hmm. to, get, you have, to, be, you have to be smart, but then that's the, that's the, that's the case with all of us. Okay. Uh, and it's a pain in the neck to, to have to research your defence afterwards because invariably it takes far longer yeah. to research your defence than ever it took to research the story in the first place. But, uh, but it might be. But how does it work? Do you know, how, how do they decide who runs Ofcom? Is that the government makes the appointment or some independent body? Or how do they make sure that it doesn't become a government tool? It's, uh, I mean, it's, it's risky, of course. Uh, the government appoints 
the chief executive of Ofcom, uh, and, uh, and the chief executive then, uh, then appoints those who investigate complaints. And, of course, as we've seen with this BBC case at the moment, uh, there, can be, there can be problems. You've got uh, the, the BBC um, uh, pu- um, broadcaster programme criticising Crufts, say, uh, and... Criticising? Crufts. The, the dog show. pedigree dog show. Oh, yeah. And, and, and saying that, um, effectively, that, you know, lots of dog breeders were, were eugenicists who bred... Uh, oh, yeah. You know, uh, uh, bred um, a defect into dogs. Yeah. The complaint went, that went to Ofcom by the Kennel Club <laughs> is being investigated by um, an Ofcom investigator who... Used, who has links with the Kennel Club. So clearly, it's, it's, not, it's not infallible. But it might be the beginning of something, mightn't it? But it's, probably, it's, yeah. it's a hell of a lot better than the PCC, I suspect. Yeah, but, but it's a good talk. Because part of the problem that, that we have in trying to defend the press and find this solution is that um, while the bad guys know very clearly what they want, which is the status quo, the good guys haven't got a clear and agreed alternative. And we need to come up with one pretty quickly. So it's a good starting point. Uh, should we go here, just because the mic's nearby? We all look at over there. Thanks, I'm convenient. Um, <laughs> um, who would be on this kind of independent panel? You'd have to have somebody who was um, entirely incorruptible or entirely clean, because yeah. as soon as any kind of story gets out on somebody, then the press may have power over them. Yeah. I think partly you can deal with that by having a process which is transparent. So whoever it is who sits on this panel, we should know an awful lot about them, and we should know how they're being appointed and how they're being paid. It, among the many great hypocrisies of the Press Complaints Commission is that although <clears throat> it's, it claims to be regulating the press and the press believes in openness, it's fantastically secretive. It won't allow itself to be covered by the Freedom of Information Act, so we can't extract anything from it. And it's funded by the big newspaper companies, but it won't tell us how much comes from each company. So it's highly secretive. So transparency would be part of the argument. So if there was, I don't know, a, a, a well-respected lawyer on this panel whose brother works in Industry X, and Industry X was the subject of the story that he was adjudicating on. That would be clear and known, and he would have to stand down because it would be obvious that he had some kind of interest. So transparency would help a bit. I think... The the trouble is also where you get the political force from. You see, I did have this thought that one way of doing this would be, if we could get the money, to set up a kind of shadow newsroom that would sample the stories that are produced by all the national news organisations, test, this is on the falsehood point, test their accuracy, and then produce a kind of rolling percentage to show what proportion of the stories produced by each news organisation was false or distorted. (coughs) And what we would need is a law that required newspapers to label their contents in the same way as food is labelled, so that you know what it is inside that you're buying. So this would mean that when you bought a newspaper, there above the masthead it would say, The Times, 46% of our stories over the last six months. Or when you turn on the radio, after the welcome to 4 o'clock news, 62% of our stories have proved to be false or distorted over the last three months. And this, this would work, because the consumers would just say, Sod it, I'm going. And it's the money, it's the, the most sensitive part of a corporate uh, media owner's body is his wallet. So if you could hit them in the wallet because the consumers backed off, they would, start, they would be compelled, I think, to lift their game. But you can see that the, the problems that are in there are, A, where do you get the money to run this shadow newsroom because it's quite a big organisation, and B, where do you get the government that's willing to take on the news organisations to pass the law that requires them to carry the numbers? But I like thinking about it. <laughs> should, we, should we take the mic over this way? One in the middle there, maybe? <coughs> Welcome back, Michael. Name? Sorry, could you give your name, please? Hi, my name's Rosie Wilde. Um, my question is, do you think there's a correlation between the concentration of the ownership of the mm-hmm. news media and this decline in truth-seeking? Because it, it seems to me that the fact that Rupert Murdoch owns so much, not just of Britain's, mm-hmm. but of the world's media, actually makes mm-hmm. him more powerful than the government, and therefore the government has to kind of toady to him. And if each major newspaper was owned by a different person, then the government or whoever would be able to, say go away to one newspaper yeah. because there would be a genuine alternative. Yes, it um, probably is. I mean, Murdoch's... Yeah, I, I think you're right, this concentration of power point. And Murdoch's power is reaching the point where he's behaving like a cartoon caricature of a media owner. He just gets what he wants. And now he has his son, the repulsive James Murdoch, running around doing the same thing. James Murdoch made this speech at the Edinburgh Television Festival where he argues that because the BBC has this very busy news website which gives news away for free, 
The BBC is damaging newspapers, and therefore the, the, the BBC News website must be closed down, the licensee must be top-sliced and all the rest of it. Just stand back and look at the history of newspapers in this country over the last 30, 40 years and ask yourself, which family on this planet have done the most damage to our newspapers? How dare the family that launched the sun and dragged our tabloid newspapers down into the gutter, the, the newspaper that bought the Sunday Times at a point when it was probably the best newspaper in the world and riddled it with inaccuracy and right-wing politics. How dare that family claim that anybody else has damaged newspapers in this country, let alone the BBC, which happens to have a culture of honesty. It's sickening, sickening. But along comes David Cameron, like Rupert Murdoch's catamite. You know what a catamite is, a kind of sexual plaything. And, and he, he says, oh, oh, yes, Governor, you want the BBC cut back? Certainly, Governor. You want Ofcom's power reduced? Certainly, Governor. Anything else I can do for you? And actually, there is something else brewing on the horizon here. You should watch this develop. Murdoch wants to put a paywall around his news websites. OK, he has two big obstacles to do that. First of all, when, when he announced that, a lot of people said, Murdoch is stupid, he doesn't understand the internet. Ah, 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 ah. You can attach almost every derogatory adjective in the dictionary to Rupert Murdoch, but not stupid. Right? Greedy, power-hungry, unscrupulous, that's Rupert. But you can't call him stupid. If he's to put these paywalls around his, webs his, his uh, news websites, he has to overcome two major obstacles. One, there's no point in him charging for the news on his sites if, everybody, if other news websites are giving it away for free. So, number one, he sits down with the other news organisations and says, look, guys, I'll start charging, you start charging, we'll all be charging, and the BBC, get out, right? That's the attack on the BBC. That's what that's about, trying to get that free website closed. So, right, all the news websites in Mur Murdoch's imagination reach a point where they all start charging. Then the other problem is it only takes one geek to come over his paywall, grab his news, get over the other side and mirror it out at 8 o'clock in the morning across thousands and thousands of other websites across the planet and still nobody will pay to read Rupert's wretched news, right? So what is he going to do about that? M months, I've been trying to get people to listen to this for months. If you look at what's happening on the continent, the French, for example, have been trying to introduce legislation that says that if you download audio or video from the web to which you are not entitled you will be cut off from the internet. You won't be allowed to use it. Once that principle is established, what is to stop governments under pressure from these very powerful media proprietors saying, and the same applies to text, if the geek comes over the wall and takes Rupert's news without paying for it, the geek gets cut off and is not allowed to use the internet. And have you seen that Peter Mandelson, who goes on holiday in Corfu with the Murdochs, has now introduced legislation along the French lines dealing with audio and video, right? You download those without consent, you get cut off. And he slipped in a paragraph that says this, should have, this could have wider applications in the future in relation to copyright. That's Rupert's clause, right? It is happening. What you're looking at here is the entire world wants the internet to be unregulated. This tiny, very powerful elite of media uh, proprietors want the internet to be regulated so that they can make money out of it. And so a battle will emerge. The people of the planet against its media proprietors. Who's going to win? I wouldn't bet on the people. No? G g governments do what these creatures ask for. Anyway, I can't even remember oh what you asked Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> it's Was getting it? more and more scary. Yeah. OK, more questions? Or are we all stunned into it was, depression? Hand there. Yeah, over here. And then at the back. Uh, yeah, Lee Salter, University of the West of England. Hi. Um, your question, so I'm an academic, so I've got to kind of make a I know, point, I get uh, an academic you. point. But, yeah. you know, you, your premise starts off with what I think, you know, from your book and from what you said to be a fantastic analysis of the problems of a commercial basis uh, yeah. of, of journalism. And, you, you know, when you explain the impact of that, increased work, um, cutbacks in staff, you see exactly the same thing happening in universities. Um, 2007, yeah. Tony Blair explicitly abandons the pursuit of truth as an objective of a university, instead replacing it with uh, its contribution to the economy. Yeah. Right? And all that entails, and now we're, we're suffering this at the yeah. moment. But your question relates to um, attacks on privacy and how you can set up uh, uh, some kind of organisation to deal with these issues. Now, it appears to me that if you're arguing the whole problem of the truth in journalism is underpinned by the commercialism of journalism and a specific form of the commercialism, then surely the solution 
has to address that sort that, of commercialism. Like Indeed, it. I think the lady here was quite right about ownership as, as one example. Oh, yeah. But then, you know, we've got to bear in mind corporate shareholders in media organisations who don't give a stuff what's in the newspapers but just want their money. Sure, that's and the so then we've got a follow-on, which is, you know, you talked about if you have this labelling of newspapers, people would abandon the sun and the news of wor the world. They already know it's crap, but they still buy it. So there's also this central question of the status of truth in our society. Mm -hmm. Who needs it? Gordon Brown doesn't. Tony Blair didn't. Yeah. The war in Iraq didn't. You know, so there's, there's these two questions. One is this sort of commercial underpinning and when you, whether you've got any ideas about how to address that. And the other is this more general question about, you know, if even universities can't pursue the truth, yeah. what value has truth when everything is reduced down okay. to its economic function? All right. I, I, I do think this is... The future's terribly interesting, but kind of worrying in this respect. If you take the second question first, I, I do think that the, the truth, truth is on the decline. There's um, an American comedian called Stephen Colbert, I think his name is, who coined a very good expression. He uses the expression wikiality, replacing reality. That's to say it doesn't matter whether or not a particular statement is true. If enough people sign up to it, we'll treat it as though it's true. That's what he's saying. And that is potentially the future for us. And that future is particularly likely to occur if, as is possible, not necessarily likely but possible, the profession of journalism dies and ceases to exist over the next two or three decades. You then have, what I think, a kind of information chaos in which, uh, first of all, things fragment. So the fascist gets his news from a fascist website. The green guy goes to the green website. The paedophile goes to the paedophile website. Everybody finds information or pseudo-information which suits their predisposition. And there is nobody out there who says, we're checking and we can be relied upon to tell you the truth which in principle is what journalists do. That, I think, is really quite scary and not impossible. So then, if you come back to the, the first part of the question, is about how we deal with this underlying commercial pressure, which I think is responsible for generating the falsehood and this unbridled invasion of privacy. And the, the, the irony here is this, that what's actually happening is that the, the business model, which is at the heart of all that commercialism, is dying. So you see, for, for decades, newspapers have funded their journalism from two sources of income. We sell newspapers and we sell advertising space. Now, the big corporations who've taken over these newspapers over the last three or four decades damaged the content of the news. So particularly in local newspapers, readers started to drift away. Corporations couldn't care less. They were producing the newspapers much cheaper because they got rid of a lot of the journalists and they'd sold their offices and all that stuff. The advertising that they were getting on local newspapers was massive. They had an effective monopoly. That's phase one. They're losing readers, but it doesn't matter. Phase two, along comes the internet. Readers start to just plunge out the door to go to free news websites, and now the advertising goes too, right? Pouring out of the door, because it's, it makes much more sense to advertise on a website, which is A, probably free, and B, probably geared precisely to the people you're trying to reach, whereas a newspaper may reach a million people, but you only want to reach 10,000 of them. So both sources of income are now pouring out the door. And then along comes the credit crisis, phase three, and accelerates the, down f f the flow of advertising money going out of the door. So suddenly, the business model is under real pressure. And if you ask, what will happen when the credit crisis is over? You look at banks, they will float back with a business model that makes sense. They will lend money and invest money at profit. Ours, I don't think, will come back. The advertising won't come back to newspapers. Like, for example... I would think in quality newspapers, the biggest single source of advertising income for us has been the National Health Service, the biggest employer in Europe. Every time they wanted to hire a doctor or a nurse or an administrator, they paid to advertise in the quality press. Now, the NHS has its own website, and they advertise there for free. Anybody who wants a job in the NHS goes to that website, they hit their market, it doesn't cost them. Why would they come back and spend millions of pounds a year advertising in The Guardian and The Times? I think we've lost them for good. Right? So our business model is crumbling. So we then think, OK, we can, we can make the whole thing cheaper by producing electronic newspapers. We're just a snitch away from it. If you, you know the thing that Amazon produced, the Kindle, that you can read a book wherever you go. Basically, a, a, a screen kind of like that, a little bit lighter uh, in weight. You could fold up and put it in your pocket like a diary, but you can sit on the bus, on the train, at breakfast in the bath, and read your newspaper electronically. Well, then we can start to produce a much cheaper paper. We don't have to pay to print It, it stops. We don't have to pay to distribute it. That stops. So huge cost savings. This produce these electronic papers. But where does the income come from? 
At the moment, the, the, the websites carry very, very little advertising, even less than the newspapers in their state of decline, and the readers won't pay for it, which is what Rupert Murdoch is trying to tackle. But if you follow that through, it looks as though the most likely outcome is that the big mass media organisations will die. And all of this bad behaviour we may look back on and see as death throes, desperate attempts to somehow find enough money to keep going. Right, so they die. So then, is there a prospect for journalism that's not commercially driven? Is what I'm trying to get to. And there are little signs of hope. Like in America, there are, if, if mass media are dying, what you're seeing to, is the beginning of creation of what you call mini-media. A small group of journalists get together, set up a website... Very low cost, no printing, no distributing, probably no office. And they target a particular area. It might be a geographical area or a subject area. And if they can put information on that website that people can't get anywhere else because it's specialised, like, for example, you might get a group of defence correspondents who have been made redundant. They set up a a website, they call it armstrade.org. And anybody who's interested in the arms trade knows that the information on that website can't be obtained anywhere else. Then people will subscribe to it and you could carry advertising, and you can fund it. And what's happening in America is people are setting up mini-media, and they're also getting funding from non-profit sources, like big foundations, rich families, NGOs, like Amnesty International or Greenpeace. Uh, Or they're linking up with universities and using students as a source of slave labour, saying, we are educating you to be journalists. Come on, work for us without us paying you. So there are other kind of alternative models emerging to fund these mini-media. But at the moment, you can't see that mini-media will expand to the kind of scale where they could replace mass media. But that's the nearest thing to good news I've got to give you. Hmm. Any more for any more? Uh, wh- where's the mic? Well, do you want to go up the top there? Yep. Okay. <laughs> Please remember to give your name. Thanks. Hi. Uh, my name's Tim Lezard, and I'm a, a journalist here in the southwest. Thanks for your, your speech, Nick. It was very interesting, as is your book. Um, I've worked in the local media for 22 years, and it's a bit of a reunion here, seeing lots of former colleagues at the Western Daily Press and the Bristol Evening Post who've suffered from a lot of these uh, problems that you've been talking about. Um, there's a couple of points I was going to make. I mean, one is about Ofcom, the, the point that James makes. I mean, I think Ofcom is a fairly toothless regulator. I think the last time I was here, there was a meeting with Ofcom when we were trying to convince them not to close ITV West and merge ITV West with ITV West Country, yeah. uh, which failed. So now we have in the Southwest one ITV company. That I mean, it takes longer to travel from, the, from Land's End to Tewkesbury than it does to uh, travel from London to Carlisle, all covered by one regional media outlet, which I think is, is disgraceful. But one other point quickly was about the um, Andy Coulson. I don't know if you knew that he's been uh, accused of bullying and found guilty of bullying yeah. one of his former uh, reporters, sports that's reporters true. today, yeah. but that, of course, hasn't been mentioned in any of the press apart from The Guardian. Yeah. That, that's going to be a, quite interesting, I think, when that gets out. I, I thought it was a very interesting example of that network of influence that Murdoch has. Do you know this story? Andy Coulson, as editor of the News of the World, takes against a sports reporter called Matt Driscoll and bullies and bullies and bullies and makes his life hell until Driscoll is driven out of his job. Driscoll then goes to an employment tribunal and I think it was on Monday evening uh, we discovered that he had been paid out £795,000 in compensation. That's a big story, right? And the only newspaper that's run it is The Guardian. Don't want to get into a fight with Murdoch. It's, It's awful the way this goes on. Did you want to say something else? I did, but I actually had a question as well. Sorry. Um, the, 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 the question, um, I've done a lot of work with the National Union of Journalists, and we have a conscience clause. Um, for those that don't know, uh, if you're a member of the NUJ, then you sign up to our code of conduct, which is kind of an ethical guidelines for journalists. And a few years ago, we introduced the conscience clause, which, which explicitly states that if, as a journalist, as a reporter, or a sub, or as a photographer, or anybody that originates copy, if you've been asked to do something that is against your conscience and against the code of conduct, then you are allowed to refuse that. And my question to you is, I wonder, we, we raised that with the PCC. I've sat in meetings with, um, with Christopher Mayer, the, uh, yeah. who John Prescott called the red socked twat. Yeah. It was quite funny. He was being polite. Um, and I, 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 I just wondered what you thought, is, you know, if, if that was to come in, would that help individual journalists, do you think, to, to help uh, change the media for the better? It's difficult because the, 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 the Press Complaints Commission Code of Conduct, which is substantially the same as the NUJ one, is already written into the employment contracts of most Fleet Street journalists. And there it sits, sparkling in a pretty kind of way, on paper. 
but the reality of how a newsroom operates is that if you say to the news editor, I'm not going to do that because it's unethical, you get the kind of treatment that Andy Coulson meted out to his sports reporter, Matt Driscoll. You get bullied, you don't get given stories, you don't get your byline in the paper. So, yes, in principle, we might as well do it. Let's do it. But it's very, very difficult to enforce against all those commercial pressures. A lot of newsrooms, I talk about this a bit in the book, are, they run a kind of regime of fear. The, 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 the deal with The Guardian is that there's no regime of fear. It's all like a sort of rather polite club. People sit around with their feet on the desk, not really working terribly hard. And, but we don't get paid very well. The, the other, it's the opposite in all the other papers. The, the worst regime of fear uh, is, the, is the Daily Mail. Because you have this man at the top, Paul Dacre, who has this ghastly, ghastly temper... And he shouts and yells and swears at his executives who shout and yell and swear at the reporters who go out into the world and do terrible things. And you know, if you've come across Dake, he has this strange nervous thing where he's always scratching his shoulder really like this, prowling around the place. And his favourite swear word is, is what we politely call the C word, which he throws at so many people in the office that he's known in the office as the vagina monologue. <laughs> <laughs> but so my, my point is... It's all right if you've got a contract that says thou shalt not do wrong. If you've got D Dacre swearing and shouting, all right, I'll do wrong. Never mind. <laughs> did did Mike want to say something? Yeah, here? sorry. Wait, wait, I've lost the mic. No, I think well, you, why don't you pass it across there as you're coming down? Yeah. Hello, my name's Gary Shipsey. I'm not a journalist. Uh, <laughs> all right. Badge I of honour. I just wondered, uh, you mentioned the Information Commissioner and Freedom of Information briefly. I just wondered if you could give us any insight into whether you've used the Act or what do you feel about it or whether it's... Any thoughts on it, really? The, the Freedom of Information Act. Uh, it, it, so, when Tony Blair was in opposition before April 97, one of the things he said is, I get into power, we'll introduce a Freedom of Information Act like the one the Americans have, really muscular way of getting information out of public bodies. So then he won the election in April 97, May 97, and went rather quiet about it. Because once you're in government, you don't really want the press extracting information. And the whole thing was stalled out for a year or two. They started having meetings, and they said, well, we'll have this Freedom of Information Act, but we think we should have rather a lot of exemption clauses so that we don't actually hand, have to hand over too much. And eventually they come up, came up with this law that, that is worth something to us. It is a tool that journalists can use, but it's a lot weaker than we wanted. And they finally sorted it out, and drafted the legislation and passed it in around, it was 1999-2000. And they then said... This is a very complicated and difficult law to implement. We don't think we'd actually put it into force until the 1st of January 2005. So they bought themselves another five years without freedom of information. And uh, my local MP in Sussex is a Lib Dem called Norman Baker, who's a good man. Uh, the, the sign that Norman is such a good man is that he has terrible teeth, which are all crooked, and he will not have them operated upon. And he has egg on his tie, and he doesn't care. <laughs> he's, he's not trying to get promoted. He just wants to make the world a better face. So about th three or four months before this... Freedom of Information Act finally came into force on the 1st of January 2005. Norman put down a lot of questions to different government departments asking how much shredding they were doing. And I thought, well, there's no way he's going to get an answer because you don't measure that kind of thing. But in fact, he got remarkably honest answers which showed that they were going shred crazy, <laughs> getting rid of documents before the law came into force. So there have been many weaknesses around the law, but actually, nevertheless, it is a tool that journalists have been using most spectacularly in the case of the MP's expenses, which was uh, dragged out because of uh, Heather Brook using the Freedom of Information Act. But, but other, lots and lots of smaller examples. So it helps somewhat. Uh, where, where are the hands? Where is the mic? Yeah, gentleman in the white shirt has been... What, here? No, yes, no, no here, I think here, this here. one. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Au fin. If we work our way down. Is that me? Oh, John. Speaking to this, I suppose. Um, Stuart McGill, I've got no connection with the media whatsoever, apart from the fact that I occasionally read a newspaper. Um, I'd, I'd like to suggest that there's a factor missing from your analysis, uh, which is demand. Mm -hmm. um, you've talked a lot about the decline of the press. Uh, for example, Murdoch dragging uh, newspapers into the dirt. Yep. But I can remember The Sun um, starting as a, a Labour-supporting broadsheet in Quite the 60s. Right. <clears throat> and effectively going bankrupt. Murdoch buying it for a song, putting naked women on page three, yeah. and all of a sudden it's the Soraway Sun, the biggest selling newspaper in the country. Yeah. Um, I'm going to suggest that part of the decline in the press and the quality of journalism is demand-led. It's yeah. not simply a supply-side question. People read the mail because they want people to hate, mm -hmm. and it gives them a new group to hate every week. Uh, the clinically sane Melanie Phillips will single somebody out. 
and uh, yeah. whether it's asylum seekers, health and safety executive, uh, European Union, the nanny single state. parents, yeah. whatever, yeah. yeah. And people read that because they want to read it. Yeah. No, um, well, I'm, I'm sorry. I, I, I think you, you, you must be right. I think there's actually been, I'm sure people somewhere have studied this, a really interesting kind of tectonic shift in the way that people think about themselves. And this shift has got something to do with Thatcherism and Reaganism, so that uh, people, if you get, people who would once have said, I identify myself in social terms, I, I'm working class, or I'm a trade unionist, now simply identify themselves as consumers. And uh, part, there's, there's, there's a, a factor in here which I think is the, this is appropriate actually for the Ben lecture, the expulsion from the mainstream of politics of socialism because of the Labour Party capitulating and everything else that went on, means that the political spectrum is narrowed and most political debate is simply managerial. There are no great ideas and alternatives at stake. It's simply a question of how do we manage this capitalist economy with all its bits and pieces. And for that reason, people have less reason to care, less reason to be interested because the debate is so narrow. And plus, they now identify themselves as consumers anyway. So the big question is not how can we reorganise the National Health Service so that everybody has a longer life. It's how can I afford my next holiday? I think I may not have put that terribly well, but you, I, I'm trying to agree with you that there's been a huge shift, I think, away from... But on the other hand, that doesn't mean everybody's gone. Look at this lot. You know, you come out on a cold November night to listen to some git groaning on about the media. <laughs> you must care about the world and what happens to it. So there's still a substantial minority of people who want to know the truth. Where are we going now? Where's the mic? We have Mike and James. Do you, do you want to get here in the middle of this third row back? Um, hi, my name is Winnie, Winnie King. I'm from the University of Bristol. Um, as a Canadian coming to Britain, I was very impressed with the extent to which when you listen to the Today Show for the first time and John Humphreys really attacking a lot of politicians to the extent that they do to try and really get the answers yeah. that they need to get for the public to know the reality of things. Um, and I think, I mean, I don't know if you care from a Canadian's perspective, but when you, a lot of what you're discussing in British media is happening across the world. Right? Oh, yeah. So what you see in America as maybe not as commercially driven, but more ideologically and partisan driven, mm -hmm. um, you have this beacon, for me anyways, of John Stewart and Stephen Colbert, who really try to challenge the media. I mean, as mm -hmm. he may be a comedian, but they're part of the media. And when you listen to the debates happening um, during the 2008 um, presidential election, sorry, 2008 presidential yeah. elections, he was the one, those two were the ones that everyone turned to to get the truth. Right. And I don't know if that could actually happen in Britain. I mean, I don't know if society-wise well, and culturally-wise that would happen. Yeah. Well, an awful lot of what happens in the British media is picked up secondhand from the Americans, so there's no question. Television executives are looking. Do you know this John Stewart show? Yeah. yeah. So you basically have a comedian ripping the news apart, and he's being funny so people laugh, but also they get this feeling of getting the inside track. So, so television executives are looking for the British John Stewart, no question about it. And the nearest they've got to it is Charlie Brooker, you know, who's done this programme Newswipe, occasionally I've been on it. And he's kind of getting there, but he hasn't hit the same nerve, I don't think, as John Stewart. It hasn't become a national talking point. But it tells you something, doesn't it, about the weakness of the media, that a whole nation of 220 million people looking for the truth goes to a comedian rather than a journalist. But they're quite brutal in the way they do it. I mean, I yeah, no, well, that's, that's all right. I think we can be brutal in search of the truth. Okay, okay um, but the British are okay. Sorry, are also <laughs> in a room of British. Right. But um, there's a, a, I mean, if I correct me if I'm wrong, but there's a sense in the culture where there's, you just don't go past a certain point. In Canada or Britain? Here. Oh, I'm not of sure. Of being inappropriate right? to, I don't know. <laughs> no, I, I wouldn't. I don't know. It's a, it's a difficult thing to to be sure about. I would have thought we, I mean, the, the classic thing is if you look back. At, at, say, television interviews with politicians in the 50s, and it's, thank you, Minister, for sparing your time. Would you mind asking a question? It's all terribly deferential. Now I would have thought there's almost no boundaries, because for one reason or another, partly for the reasons I'm talking about, so that, uh, you know, l l look at the phones whose messages they've been intercepting. Government, military, police, royal. Uh, there's David Brunkett, the Home Secretary. Uh, they discover he's in a legover situation with somebody, and they, they rip his private life apart twice. So they, they, I, I'm, 
I don't think there's much kind of respect and deference around, rightly or wrongly. You get, you get the right end of that. I would have thought that people like John Humphreys and Jeremy Paxman are still flying the flag for decent journalism, and they're not afraid to bully uh, politicians if they think it'll help to get the truth out. Uh, Mike. There's a certain irony. Mike, Mike Jameson from MediaWise is tomorrow I'm being interviewed <clears throat> by the BBC for a programme with Mark Thomas, and Mark Thomas is a comedian who is... Oh, yeah who's actually taken the place of a lot of investigative journalism. Mm -hmm. And the issue that he's going to be dealing with in his... He's creating a manifesto by going around the country asking people what new laws there should be, what should be in a new manifesto for Britain. And we're talking tomorrow about self-regulation, funnily yeah. enough. And I just want to raise with you... You asked this question about what sort of a model. And I think there was a model proposed by Clive Soley back in the early 90s mm -hmm where he was proposing an independent body which on the one hand would adjudicate on complaints and on the other would be a watchdog for press freedom so that it would be seen by journalists as something which made sure that Parliament, a bit like the, the uh, Human Rights Act, now all legislation has to fit hmm. within the terms of the Human Rights Act. We, we need something to make sure that there aren't encroachments on media freedom. And his proposal was we have a body that does the two things that investigates complaints about the media and defends press freedom. Okay. The irony of the collapse of that bill is that the, the, the uh, text of the bill was given to the Guardian in advance of its publication in Parliament, and the Guardian advertised it on its front page as a privacy bill, even though it made no mention of privacy, but that was the red light to The Sun and the Murdoch newspapers who then trashed the, the proposal as a privacy bill frightened the living daylights out of MPs and so it fell. So there are certain ironies in this, but I think that that model still is worth trying again. Yeah, okay. I mean, I can see that it's, it's, it's helpful in the sense of parliamentary politics, or should be, if you can say this is a bill which helps you and defends you as well as giving muscle to regulation. I still think we haven't quite solved the problem, although it off come maybe the beginning of it, with how you actually constitute it so that it operates independently of the media and of government, so that we can trust it. Um, is there any more for any more? What do you want to I do? I think James wanted to say something. Who's it? <coughs> One more if... Uh, yeah, there's if a few at the back. But, but, but um, I was going to ask you... The Guardian will, will outlast you, just, I say, you know, probably. Have you been talking so to a doctor? You, <laughs> you, you, you'll be all right, but, you Thank know, you. students who are leaving university now yep. and would like to do the same sort of job that, that you have done very successfully for many years, how are they going to get by? Because a group of them working for a website mm -hmm. are not going to earn money yet because, we don't, we don't, yeah. because websites can't, you know, they, they can't monetize their content. So... And in investigative journalism is incredibly expensive. Mm -hmm. You need to have the time to research, indeed th the ability to fail, because sometimes you follow a lead that turns out to be wrong or, sure. or, you, or you just can't get to the bottom of it. So, you know, when benevolent w employers like The Guardian have gone, as presumably they will, what's gonna, how are investigative journalists going to... Going to earn a living at the same time as doing their job. Well, hang on. So if, we, if, you, if you look into the long-term future, I, I'm really not sure what the answer to that is. If you were asking a different question, which is how can students now earn a living? I thought that was where you were going with this, because it's a slightly different thing. It's just that um, I, was, I was interviewed by some radio station earlier today, and I wanted to say first that from a selfish point of view, I want the student journalists to carry on coming into the industry, because it's one of the few definitely good things that's still happening, is that journalism att attracts intelligent, energetic, idealistic people, and we need them. And, okay, it is definitely tough to find work. And it, it, what you are going to have to do, any journalist here, student journalist, is take shit work for as long as it takes to get yourself into an organisation like the BBC or the Guardian or the Observer. The three main ones, because they're owned by trusts, not corporations, so there's a culture of honesty in there. They fail all too often, but, but they're the ones to aim for. And then work on the office politics so that you've got the protection of a senior executive who will make sure that you get the time to do serious stories. But you're talking about kind of working your way up the ladder for, I don't know, three, four, five years, maybe longer until you can get yourself into that position. But go for it. Try it. Because you might succeed. And I would say if you fail, or supposing let's say the entire industry fails, and ten years down the track there is no work, 
the skills of a journalist are very transferable. So if, if you know how to take a, a complicated 10,000-word document and express it clearly in 800 words, the civil service would eat you up. Big corporations would, would, would want you. If you learn the, the most important skill in reporting, which is to, te- to, to persuade somebody to talk to you when they don't want to, that, that strange human skill, again, all sorts of places would want you. So, do you see, I, I would say go for journalism. Because the other thing about being a journalist, it is fantastically good fun because you get paid to go and talk to interesting people and go to interesting places and see interesting things. You know, the, like, just whatever it is that's happening. Like in my early career working as a news reporter at The Guardian, there were like the siege at the Iranian embassy. Do you remember that when the SAS went in? All that stuff. I was standing there on the pavement watching it all live. It's just sensational. And then as you get a bit older, you get paid to be horrible to bad people. This is thrilling. <laughs> so I would encourage them all to come through, knowing that there's a safety net there of completely other sorts of work if we do collapse. Um, are there any other hands? There was a, a lady in green at the back. Okay. Anyone else? We've got time for a couple more, but then we have to wrap up. <coughs> oh, it's so dark, you see, I can't see. Okay, so we do one there and then one there. Oh, yeah. Okay. 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 Hey, uh, Hi. I'm Cassie, and I'm a student at UE. Uh, is there a role for the NUJ in press regulation? In press regulation? Right, what do you mean? In, in, in this kind of body that we're... Setting yeah. up. I don't know. That's a good question. The, the, maybe there is. I don't know. I don't know. Did you, what do you think? Is there a role for the NUJ? Yeah. You're bound to say yes. <laughs> but Definitely. I you, I, all right. If we, if we talk honestly about the NUJ, here's the thing. At its best, the NUJ is terribly important to journalists because it gives us the kind of muscle within the office that might allow us to stand up to the bad proprietor, the bullying news editor, the corrupt editor. Yes. At its worst, the problem is that because most journalists can't be bothered to go to their chapel meetings and branch meetings and so on, there are times when the union is run by people who are politically completely disconnected from the bulk of the membership. And that causes problems because journalists worry that the people who are speaking for them are speaking from a completely different songbook to their own, political songbook. Do you see? That has been a problem in the union. And I, think if you were gonna, eh? Sorry? I think I think that's fair enough. So and I'd like to make a plug and say, come to branch meetings, join the union. <laughs> yeah. The more of us there are, the more sensible it is. Um, I don't know where the mic is, but there were some more hands up at the back. Yeah. Do one at the end of this? Can you see? Yeah, on the back row, far end. We've only got another about five minutes, I think. Hi, Tony Gosling. Uh, I do a current affairs program on community radio with a bunch of uh, volunteers every week. And uh, on your question of regulation and who should be doing the regulation, I actually find some of the most common sense that comes out uh, on our program is our weekly Vox Pop. We literally go out onto the street and ask people questions about whatever the issues are of the day. So I suggest if you want people to do some regulation, why don't you just pick random people in the street? They'd probably do a lot better job than the PCC or anybody else that's appointed (laughs) to the job. Uh, Yeah, actually, she's just saying, like, jury service. Back to Magna Carta, even. Yeah, back to Magna Carta. Yeah, no, all right, nothing wrong with that idea. Yeah, yeah, why not? You might need a few specialist lawyers on hand that they could consult, but, yeah, why not? Any more hands, or should we all bugger off? (laughs) uh, Have you all got... I thought there was one more up there. No? Okay, I think you'd be a fantastically patient, long-suffering audience. It's the best part of two. Have we got some more? No? Okay, one more. This is the last and final one, and then we can all get time off for good behaviour. Stay steady, it's the last one. (laughs) Hi, Nick. Uh, Paul Breeden, um, Bristol NUJ. Um, Thanks ever so much. Um, You've you've really shown, if if nothing else, that um, journalists really do need time to um, develop their stories, and uh, blogging (laughs) isn't enough. Um, and that we, we need role resource journalism. I, I just want to ask you a quick question. I don't know if you can answer this quickly, but I'm worried about Detective Sergeant Maberly. Oh, yeah. And I wonder, because he's the man who seems to hold the key to this story you're talking about, the news of the world, and the PCC, he's the only person the PCC wrote to, as far as we can see, in this investigation mm-hmm. you talked about, and he didn't reply. So do you know if he's well? No, I don't, actually. M- Mark Maberly is a Detective Sergeant, I think he's recently been promoted, who worked on the original investigation into Clive Goodman and Glenn Malcair. And when Gordon Taylor started suing a year or two later, Gordon Taylor's lawyers were at one of the court hearings and uh, were speaking to the cops. And this man, Mark Maberly, has since been reported by Gordon Taylor's lawyer 
to have said, we've discovered there were something like 6,000 victims of this phone hacking, interception of messages, by the news of the world, right? And th that was given in evidence to this select committee that I keep referring to. But there, there is some contention about this because Scotland Yard, weeks later, wrote a letter to the Dreadful Press Complaints Commission saying, that's not true, Mark Maberly never said it. And the lawyer who gave that evidence, quoting the cop, telling him 6,000, the, the lawyer has now come up with a second witness, a barrister, who heard this being said. So there's two options. One, the lawyer imagined it and got it wrong. Two, Scotland Yard are extremely embarrassed about the fact that having said there were only a handful of victims, one of their own people has been quoted saying there are 6,000. And so they've said to him, we're writing a letter saying that what you said you didn't say. So shut up. You can make your own mind up. Scotland Yard are not necessarily being completely frank about it. Anyway, uh, right. thank you very much for listening. It's been extremely kind. Thank you.